The people who make nigunim uh, often are locked into um, the minor modes and sometimes don't pay attention to the words. So when you have that wonderful uh, chapter 8 in Tehillim, so you don't, if I were to go, uh, will have nothing to do with, with the words. So here's what came to me about that. Ki Today is the yard site of Manasseh ben Israel. Uh, and he was an amazing person. Family came from Lisbon in Portugal where, and then settled in, um, in Amsterdam. He was the one who was painted by um, um, Rembrandt and went to London. He spoke languages. Latin, Greek, Spanish, of course, and Portuguese, and some Arabic, and so on. And he went to <coughs> England because Cromwell needed his advice. Uh, and so he persuaded Crom Cromwell to rescind Edward's uh, decree and permit Jews to come back to, to, to uh, England, to London. And it's so interesting to read some of these things about how uh, he was um, uh, Angleterra, you know, how to describe uh, how he um, uh, came back in Sokotia and Inquisition and all these kinds of things are here uh, described how he, where he went. Yes, and uh, <clears throat> Uh, King Frederick and Hedra, Friedrich Heinrich, who was the Duke of Orange Nassau, this was uh, the way in which the, the Dutch people <laughs> spoke of their kings, Oranje Nassau. And um, what I want to share with you today, Lekovit his yard site, is a piece he writes in this book. And before I start with that piece, I want you to hear how he opens up the book. 
He says, "Al mishkavi balelot rayonai saliku v'tadat shnati me'inayo machshava lo hinichali lishon." He can't sleep. What gives him trouble? What gives him trouble is the fact that nobody pays attention to the afterlife. And um, for people in in his day, he he find you know, Spinoza is around the corner. He he finds out that people are. Um, uh, this world is the only world there is, and of course this is very troublesome for him, and he wants to write. Zamoti, I kept on thinking, את יקר תפרד גדולת האדם מפעת נשמתו, כי זה אומר בכור וגם זה בכור, והוא סופר איש שוקל. סבעתי נדודים, ויהי באשמורת הבוקר, עת בור הכוכבים מעל הארץ ישנתי ואז ינוח לי, ואשא את עיניי, וארא, והנה מלאך נוגע בי ויאמר אלי, דורש ברבים בדברים נשמעים, ועת סופר מהיר קום. Uh, I will dictate to you the book that you will write, <coughs> the angel says. So he writes, <coughs> first of all, to prove uh, uh, the afterlife from proof texts, which is the first thing that, that, that people do. Shenamar, you can say. And one of the wonderful proof texts that keeps coming up is, as Yashir Moshe, if you remember that Latid Lavo, etc., etc. So that's not the whole story. Then he goes to Aristo and proves it from ish, uh, things having to do with reason. Okay? But then he says, I can also tell you from Nisayon, from experience. So I will read you <coughs> a piece here. לכן הסכמתי להעלות על ספר כדי לזכות אחרים מה שעבר לפני היום י"א לאדר ראשון ה' שין למד א' ליצירה על אודות אישה אחת שנכנס בתוך הרוח איש מישראל כאשר אסדר לפנים והאמת הוא כי מי שנמצא בעת ההיא ושמע מהרוח מה שאמר ומה שגילה הוא מי ששמע מפי שומעיהן רואה שיכניעו ליבם לשמיים ויירו ויפחדו מיום הדין על חשבון הנפש שהכל בא לידי חשבון ואין בשאול בית מנוס. There's no way you can flee, uh, you know, afterwards because it all comes up. נודע לי ממי שבא מאותו העולם וסיפר לו מה העובר לשם ואפשר שהקדוש ברוך הוא שלח לו כדי שיירו מלפניו אז חכם ימסד ואלוהים עשה שיירו לפניו וזה אינו חלום אלא בהקיץ לאין כל נמצאתי בקיבוץ רעב שהיה שם למאה אנשים ומהם בעלי תואר ראשי קהילות ויגשו אל האיש הבית אנשים יודע השבעות So two people who know how to handle such things. שידבר הרוח אשר בתוך האישה ועל ידי עשן אש וגפרית שהיו מכניסים בתוך הנכירים שלה, היא הייתה כמבוטלת שלא הייתה מרחקת עצמה ואפילו ראשה לא מצד האש ולא מצד העשן על ידי ההשפעות ההיא. היה הכל מתחיל להישמע כל אב. ונמשך כשגת אריה וכל שחל בלי שום לנוע לשון ופתיחת שפתיים. So a voice is coming out, she is not moving her mouth, she is not moving her tongue, she is not moving her lips. וכשהתחיל זה הכל להישמע היו בבית אנשים הנזכרים המחזיקים ומלחם עצמם בזריזות ובחריצות לעשות מה שהיו עושים במהירות והיו מתקוטטים ומדברים כנגדו בכל הקולות ואומרים לו, רושב, תדבר ותאמר מי אתה 
בלשון ברור. <coughs> ואז היה הכל מתגלה ומתראה לכל, כי הוא ככל בני אדם, וחזרו לומר לו בקול גדול. ועל ידי כל הנזכר, מה שמך הרשע? והיה משיב פלוני, והכינו, והכינוי, והשיב פלוני, ושאלו לו, מאיך נודע שאת נדע שאתה פלוני, השיב שנפטר בטריפולי, he gives a, a place where he died, שניח בן אחד ושמו פלוני, שהיו לו גימול נשים, ושם הראשון הפלונית, ושם הש... השנייה פלונית ושם השלישית פלונית ומהשלישית נפטר והיה, והיא נשואה כעת לפלוני ועל כל הסימנים שאמר דבר, דיבר נכונה וכושר דבר אמת ואז הכרנו כל הנמצאים לשם, כי, לש, uh, הנמצאים לשם כי הרוח הוא המדבר. Now we have his identity pegged as to who he is ושאלו ממנו, על איזה עוון אתה מתגלגל בעולם הגלגולים? How come that, that you are roaming around? השיב, על עוונות רבות שעשה בחייו, many things. וחזרו לשאול, לא, תפרט אותם, tell us in detail. אומר שלא היה רוצה, כי מה התועלת, what's the good? ואז הפצירו בו הרבה, שיפרט לפחות עוון גדול שבכולם, וענה ואמר, על שהיה מין אפיקורס, שהיה מדבר כנגד התורת משה רבינו. ועל זה העידו לפני רבים שכך היה אומר דברים כאלה בפירוש בחיי חיותו. So he admits that he was a heretic and, uh, and so on and so forth. And for this reason, hi hi, he was, uh, there's another copy around there someplace of the פרשת פרפינג. ושאלו לו, ואתה, מה אתה בזה הדעת? What do you think now about, are you still in, in agreement with what you said before as part of your heresy? והשיב כי מתענח בקול מר צועק וסוער ואמר אני מכיר שחטאתי אביתי פשעתי ושאל מחילה מהקדוש ברוך הוא מתורתו התמימה על רוב עוונות ואז התחילו הבית אנשים להפציר אמו להכיחו שיצא מתוכה וילך למקום מדבר שמים על ידי כל הנזכר לאל וכן שיבקשו עליו רחמים והתקעו שופר כדי שלא ילך בזה הגלגול. ואמרו לו, תרצה שתבקשו רחמים. והתפלו עליך והתקעו שופר, וישב, מי ייתן הלוואי? Okay. שאלו, מי יתקע שופר? אמר החכם, רב שלמה אל קבץ. So that's a story that happens in צפת. רב שלמה אל קבץ, דלך דודי מן, is there at that time, okay? השיב החכם הנזכר שלא היה יכול, חזרו לומר לו, תבקש אחר, אמר יהיה החכם אברהם לחמי, ושאלו עוד מי יתפלל עליך, השיב רבי אליהו פלקון, ואז אמרו שלוש ארבע פעמים אין מלך ויעבור בקול שופר, ונעשה הכל כפי גילוי רצונו, אז אמרנו לו פעם אחרת שייצא, כיוון שעשו לו רצונו, השיב יעבור זמן מועד, ואז יצא, I still need a little more time inside of her. ושאלו לו, תרצה שנעשה לך איזה תיקון לנפשך, אישיב שאין עמו אל שום תקנה. אמרו לו, תרצה שיאמר בנך קדיש או שילמד תורה, אישיב לא יהיה לו כלום, ובנו אין לו כדאי ללמוד תורה. ושאלתי לו, על עניין חיבות הקבר, ואישיב, איך את מהיושבים שם, זה ודאי שלא נכנס בתוך הקבר מעולם. אז אמר הרוח, וככה דבריו, נכנסתי בים הקבורה, ובאותו הלילה הוציאו הציוני ולא נכנסתי עוד ומאותו העד של ל"ג שנים שאני הולך מהר להר מגבע לגבע ולא מצאתי מנוחה בשום מקום אלא שבמשך זמן נמצאתי בשכם ונכנסתי גם כן בתוך אישה אחת ובאת בכאן והוציוני על ידי כל הכתוב לאל אלא ששמו, ששמו עליי תקף קמיות ולא יכולתי לחזור אליה 
okay? <laughs> so they had fixed her up with amulets, the other woman, and now finally is in this one. So anyway, I just wanted you to, to hear it's the yard site of Reb Manasha ben Yisrael today, and in his Sefer, Nishmat Chaim, where he talks about the afterlife, he brings these things to bear and tells stories about uh, uh, Gilgulim and so on and so forth in Dibukim. That was one of the things that Reb Simcha uh, got into. Now let me see, where is my copy? Uh, bef and s before we go to some of the uh, Slonima stuff, I wanted to learn this part with you. It's some Torah I wrote on um, Paraduma because we are now, this is Shabbos Parsha Parov, and Davar Beito Matov, it's always good to deal with something. Be'inyan para aduma, letaher temei moletame tahorim be'omer kadosh. There is this uh, um, yotzer that you say on Shabbos Parshas Parok, that you say. Who says it, you know? Uh, there'll be a couple of bar mitzvahs this Shabbos, and um, in Chabad they don't say yotzer. And maybe they'll say it at Eish Kodesh, but I can't imagine any other places they'll say Yotzer. But in the Yotzer, he touches on, on this point and says that why is it that people who have the heavy Tumah of Tumat Hamid gets purified with Paraduma, while the Kohen who does that becomes impure, okay? The Yikhu, huh? It's like a towel. A towel? Dries you, but it gets wet. Uh huh. Well, that's that's very good. That's a good mashal. Yeah. So let's see what comes out here. Ve'yichu alecha para adumat mima ve'tzarich lahavin. Ech mikayim mitzvat para aduma be'pnimet bezman she'yevshal likayma be'maase. And of course, that's the first question that always keeps coming up. There are some of these archaic things, and we can't do them. In actuality, there's no Beis Hamikdash. There's no. Uh, it's interesting because um, there was a big machloikas in in Yerushalayim between the people who wanted to go on the Harabayit and the people who <coughs> were against that. The people who wanted to go on the Harabayit said it's ours. And I tell you, when I first went on the Harabayit, and this was yet early on before all these intifadas and so on and so forth. And um, so somebody, you go up. You, you're the youngest one. <laughs> you go up and open Eve, doors. Eve is there. Eve is there? Oh, okay. She's in the kitchen. That'll go. All right, we'll see if they ring again. Uh, so where were we? Yes, Harabait. So I come up there, and I see the Jordanian flag, and the office of the Vakf, mm -hmm. as if to say that in what is at that point is already our territory, it isn't our territory. Mm -hmm. And they really made a mistake to allow uh, the custody of those places to be in the hands of Jordanians and not of Israelis. But part of the thing is also um, there are these crazy halachic notions that people come up with. Uh, how can you... We don't want to go up on the Harabayit because we're Tmei and Macy. And so we, we might go into the place that is our fear to go. And so therefore, the territory was ceded to the other people. And, and we're still suffering from that. But it was very upsetting. Lately, lately, even then, you know, this was in um, 84. Um, Yerushalayim already had a lot of traffic. And the, uh, there are all the cabs and the, the, all, uh, the buses and this and that. So it's a noisy city. When you get to the Harabayit up there, it's so calm. It's so beautiful. So 
there is the front of the Harabite where the Dome of the Rock is. And that is so beautiful. I once saw in the house of somebody a um, poster that showed the Harabait, but no longer with the uh, um, Dome of the Rock, but with a Beis Hamikdash that they had that looked so ugly. <laughs> uh, you know, a square, uh, like a fortress, you know. They, they, they painted it golden, you know, but, <laughs> but it didn't have, when you look at the Harabait, on all the pushkis that we used to have in the past, was always like mm -hmm. the Dome of the Rock was there, and it has that feminine, beautiful quality, and instead of that, there was a rock, you know, there, and didn't have much of a time. So, on the other hand, Wendell Jones, Reverend Wendell Jones from the uh, B'nai Noach mm -hmm. has been digging various places in Yerushalayim and he has been trying to find, and he claims he did find a uh, little bit of the Afer Parah. Mm -hmm. And uh, also he has uh, uh, what was it, Afer Parah? There was something more. I forgot already what it was. There was something more that he claimed that he had found uh, there, and uh, he is he's very much into those, you know, trying to find the, the the ark, the lost ark, and all that kind of all that kind of stuff. So, because they still would like to yes, and there was also born a calf. Remember there was something yeah. in the paper. At the Chabad. Huh? At at. Um Chabad. 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 And they watched that thing for several months until it, they found the pagan. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, of all places, it should be. Well, so so you can imagine, uh, <laughs> but there is there is that sense that people would like to be able to fulfill these things in uh, Gashmias right now, <laughs> but uh, what do we do when we say we can't do this? Uh, in Asiya, on the outside, how do we do that in Pneumius? Vehine, Chukazu bederech klal muval, le dugma le bechinat chok, da hainu mitzvah shi le malam le bechinat tam vedat. People bring this in general, as a, uh, when they say chukim, mishpatim, edus, so to say chukim are statues that are beyond, beyond reason. Okay. So we can say there are the, the mitzvahs that uh, are so rational that we we are compelled to deal with, with them, and even if they weren't written in the Torah, we would do that. Uh, there's a, a point where it says, if we wouldn't um, have gotten the Torah, we would have learned Nikiyot uh, Mechatul, you know, Sniyot Mechatul, and so on and so forth, because the animals would, would have taught us these things, okay. And um, you can understand that when you say, um, um, you could say, yes, I agree, that's a good thing to do. Both of these Lishonot are found in Chazal to say, don't try and, and establish the reasons for it and don't try and... and uh, and you have no right not to do it. Vehine yesh kama minektav, yesh vehadio kotev alaklav, verauy lehim achik, vezel beprinat mishpatim. You write on the cloth, and what do we know about that? For instance, when the sota uh, had to be tried and they put the ordeal, they would write the whole thing on cloth, and then they would scrape off the ink 
and make her drink that ink. So you get to see that there was a way in which you could write these things and you could erase them. Heshel Olaf was uh, very fond of that word, and I had it a moment ago. The parchment that had been erased, but faintly the writing was there. There is a good word for that. It just was was on the tip of my tongue. Okay, <laughs> it'll come back maybe. So you can erase that, and v'yesh kotvim in kankantum. And Rashi offer says, "What's kankantum? Vitriol. What's vitriol? Uh, copper sulfate." Do you remember? Uh, we used to uh, the, the ink that people used to have was that purple purplish ink mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it was hard to wash off you know <laughs> and it's uh, it's put into for instance the, the, the fingerprints mm -hmm. and so on and so forth mm -hmm. they use that one that's kankantum vim kotvim bo az afim mochkim achikach nishar alaklav roshem kachol shelaktav veharoshem aze eino nimchak legamre ki nishka kzad beklav vezeo prinas edut in other words, mm -hmm. you can't quite erase it. There is always a Rishima left. And that's so wonderful. <clears throat> when you start thinking about people who are not Mevar Chomets, but they will still do something like Covet Pesach, have a dinner. You know? uh, so you see, it's, it's, not, it's not fully there, but it can't be fully erased either. It remains in, among Jews. Rak or Hashemish Lizman Rav Yahol Lavain Afet Ataroshem Achaloni Shar. You have seen how some sunlight bleaches things out, and sunlight can bleach that one out too. So, what's the Nimshal over here? That even if there is a, a strong Roshem left, but um, the sun of assimilation shining on that will even remove that after a couple of generations. Uh, you know, if I were to ask myself, the children of a Wolfowitz or a Kissinger, you know, what are they Mikhaim at this point? You know, Sulzberger had, had children who became Episcopalians and so on and so forth. So you see that the the... The Roshem, you know, the sun can take that away. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, the thing doesn't exist anymore. It is a, the writing is negative space. It's not positive space anymore. Okay. And Heder HaYeshud is very important here because uh, it deals with that Chukim are obliterative of the ego in that way. Okay. Okay. Um, that when you go and talk about Sod, Chok and Sod have a, a relationship to each other. Velachain prinot Chok hu inyan a Sod. Vehine. Bezman shlit ad mazel tele, mi me ha avod ad chur ban abayit asheni. היו המשפטים מבחינת ניגלה, והעדוס מבחינת ניסטר. ובזמן שליטה סמזל דוגים, היינו התפתחו תורה שבעל פה, היו העדוס מבחינת ניגלה, והחוקים מבחינת ניסטר. אבל בזמן הזה התחלת דמזל דלי נתגל עם טעם מהחוקים בפעולתם השמאניים, כפשטי התורה, ולכל הפחות כרמזים בדרכי החיים. ובעיקר בזאת על ידי הכרה שבאדם יש גם כן מפרדס ומה שפעיל פועל בבחינת למעלה מן הסייכו. 
that some things, when you go into shamanic stuff, you are not asking for uh, uh, conceptual reasons to explain these kinds of things. They have an impact that is beyond beyond the mind. Im kol zeh, yesh p'chinat sod nosafa sh'alei ha'kativ sod Hashem l'irei of v'brito le'odiyam. U'bizman hazeh elef ha'shishi seda sfirat yesod, ha'sod hu sh'hayichut ha'chi atzum hu yichut זר ונוקבה, זה ערן בן בנוקבה, שהשם יזבוח נמצא בבחינת עוד ברית קודש, הצינור האמצעי, הבריח התיכון, הממשה מקטע למלכות, מבריח מן הקצה לקצה. I'll, I'll go over that. <laughs> הסוד הוא המורה, איך להמשיך כוחות הנפש לתלת שליטין, למוחו ליבה וכבדה, היינו עולים ויורדים בו בבב, העמוד האמצעי. ועוד יש סוד עצום בהשתתפות האדם עם בורו מבחינת פה אל פה, שהוא הייחוד שם בו שני ולא פה לאוזן, והמבין יבין ודל. Of our, of our time, that um, many people haven't caught up to it yet, you know? I was talking to Mark, who is preparing to go to the um, RA convention. So when I ask myself, who at the RA convention has built in Wilbur into his reality map, hmm. you know? Or to, uh, who would be talking about point uh, zero field, about uh, uh, quantum mechanics and stuff like that. And if they haven't, they're still in what you would call the modern period, not in the postmodern period. So therefore, they will deny the reality of anything that is not tangible and, 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 and reasonable this way. When you think of, uh, um, they talked about Judaism being the religion der Vernunft, you know, uh, religion of reason, it meant that all these things that uh, Heinrich Gretz would be saying, that these are the, the things that are uh, yet from the Morde or the Atalefim, that's what they they call them in the translation. Uh, animals that can't stand light, and they're the bats, yeah, because they're so full of their emunat fela, of their abaglauben, what's the word? Of, uh, superstition. Superstition, right. What we are getting to right now is that we talk about transpersonal stuff, we talk about the impact of spirit, uh, a recognition that there are non-local phenomena, and uh, uh, you go to the people who are doing energy healing and all that kind of stuff, and it seems to be a, we are in a different place. So to say, therefore, that we are in the time of Mazel Dali, and therefore we are able to see things now more in terms of pshat reasonableness than we could see him in times gone by. Mazel tov, I'll ignore it. Okay, can you ignore it? Okay. So then there is the other part <coughs> that goes with the posuk, Sod Hashem Lireyav Ubrito Lehodiyam. Now, uh, if you follow the the thing about Sheshet Alafim that we have. Uh, at one point I was uh, giving a siyum on, on uh, a, mish, a siyum mishnayas, a siyum ashas was happening. And uh, so I was saying there that if you look at the Shisha Sedarim, you see that the first uh, seder is Zraim. And the first thousand years is Raim. And then comes Moed, and in Moed comes already Matan Torah. Okay. 
the Beis Hamikdash is built and it's Nashim, you know, and then it gets to be Nezikin, the Churban Abayit. And then you get Kodeshim all the time that happens in medieval period, the, the Crusades and how many people never died. And now we're getting to Torah and uh, how to, uh, to prepare for Biyat HaMashiach. So you have that sense of the Shit al Vishnin Hava Alma in which this works out. If so, then, the, then you have Chesed, Gvura, and other Mabul, Tiferet, the Torah. Netzach and Hod, and now we are coming, we are in Yesod. So the whole Indian that keeps coming up, the Tikkun that has to happen is the Tikkun of Yesod, and that has to do with sexuality, and that's the, where the, the mystery becomes revealed, and when you talk about Briach HaTichon, that central column, HaMavriach Merakotze Lakotze, there's a sort of uh, giving a hint to Kundalini here. You know, and saying that you have those three centers that uh, the Zohar talks about. There's the brain, there's the heart, and there's the liver. And everything goes up and down on that Vav. And remember, we talked about how if the Nikuda is under the Vav, it's V. If it's in the middle, it's U. And if it's on top, it's O. So it says... And this is where the Aaron Kalina goes and says, Vayachlom, he cholomed. He took the Nikudah and took it all the way up to the top. So that means an awareness that goes very hard. V'inyan pora aduma nire be'ezrat Hashem, she pora aduma achat yesh ba koach harbe letaher kama alafim tmei nefesh. If you start figuring out um, uh, you learn in Mishnayis of Torah what is involved. You have to, uh, the water has to be done in a very special way, and you, you can't have any dew coming in. It has to be taken from a spring, and uh, no contamination there. And you have to have an ezov uh, uh, that, uh, well, how would you translate ezov? Hisop, hisop, yeah? yeah, that you would dip into that water and you would sprinkle it on, on, on the people, and asperging. Uh, by the way, asperging is still being done la uh, havel in some churches when uh, monks before they go to sleep, the abbot takes an asperge, which is sort of a, a little something. Um, that holds water, dips it into holy water, and as the people go out, he sprinkles them with that, which is like saying, may you have dreams that will be pure, and you know, and wake up in the morning the right way. So there is that kind of sprinkling that still is being done there. So you can take from one paraduma, and you can take several thousand people. <laughs> what is the what makes you tummy about that is the anger why did God have to make it so that people die and that um, is very hard to talk uh, to give reasons for there's a story about the Rebbe that Sabach <coughs> who uh, was taken to, um, he was in Petersburg, and uh, there was a, this conference that wanted to stop um, people in Russia having access and printing Hasidic Svorim, and the Haskole was really very hard on that. And they wanted to have schools and stop the Chadarim and so on and so forth. So Tzemach Tzedek went there. Before he left, he said, wait a minute, I have to pack something. And he comes to Petersburg, and in the middle of uh, the thing, they want to know, give me the reason for Paraduma. Give me the reason why you insist that rationality is not, 
is not koveya whether or not we, we what we should teach and learn. So he says, give me a few minutes, I'll be right back with the reason. <laughs> and he goes to his room and opens the pekel in which he had his tachrichim. Mm -hmm. And he brings in the tachrichim and he explains what they are. That's what you dress the corpse with. If you give me a reason why we have to die, I'll give you a reason for the other things. Oh. It's like that al korchach, and finally that was mevatel di gezera at that point. But you get a sense of how powerful that was, yeah? It occurs to me that that, I, that idea fits in with Purim, that we really, we can't judge what's, what's bad and what's good. It's, it has to go beyond that. When you have in the Chumash, um, um, so Rashi says huh. that's a heavy one oh. yeah. uh, well I tell you How something you make that leap? Huh? Where did he get well, first of all, Rashi is not reporting what he thinks. Rashi is reporting what the Chachamim said. You know, you, we always give Rashi credit for saying this, saying that, but Rashi really brings us what what Midrash and so on and so forth. Sometimes he says Kipshuto, sometimes he, he says uh, brings in the Midrash and so on and so forth. But on this one, he says the See, that's interesting because. Correct me if I'm wrong. You're the, uh, that, that in the Mora, that's the pasuk that uh, the Rambam uses as the proof text that in creation that he creates Chomer, and that's where the evil and death and all that stuff yeah. resides. Right. All right, but based upon that same pasuk, it's a whole different perspective. Of Look, it. there's always Rosh V'Kavos Char and Shivim Panim Torah and so on and so forth. And so if somebody wants to make a point, they will, they will quote the, that... So does the devil. <laughs> ...that my Machazal, uh, that'll fit their picture. But the point that uh, I want to get to here, over here, is how the Ishbitzer says, what is it that we are angry about, you know? Why is a Koyen... He talks about this, why the Kohen mustn't be metame et asmo. Mm -hmm. And he says, because the tumor of the met is, as it comes out of the tarumot that we have, why did you create death? And we are angry about that. And since the Kohen has to be teaching, siftet Kohen yishmo dat, the Torah yuvakshu pihu, so the Kohen is not in a place where he should be angry at God, so therefore, uh, he must not be metamelemet, so he shouldn't have the tarumet at this point. Uh -huh. So that's where Shlomo came in this wonderful teaching that he gave, you know. We had this meeting in Berkeley in a Pauli ballroom, uh, Torah and Dharma. Right. Mm -hmm. And there was a guy demonstrating outside Torah versus Dharma, <laughs> you know. So uh, Shlomo couldn't make it, so I asked him, would he make me a little tape, a few minutes on the tape, which he did. And then he quoted that piece of the Ishbitzer, and he said, after the Holocaust, we're all Tamei and Meitim. We haven't worked that one through yet. And up to this day, we haven't really worked it through. So he said, so what did God do? He sent us some people from the Far East who were not Tamei and Meitim at that time, so we should still be able to connect to God. <clears throat> That's a very wonderful teaching. It was yeah, David Wolf Blank brings it in. Huh? One, David Wolf Blank quotes you in one of the metaphorshiot about yeah. that. Time yeah, yeah, You gave that teaching. Well, so, so I, I, you know, it was so amazing, by the way. There was a whole panel there, and there were about 10, 12 people on the panel. And the, uh, the guy who was the moderator of the panel was uh, um, Moinedin Jablonski. <laughs> And he was the only one who wasn't Jewish. Mm. <laughs> you know, all the others, there was a Sikh, there was a turban, and there was a, a, a 
ab a, a prior of a zendo and we are back okay <laughs> that's yours all right <laughs> you take the out. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know it's 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 like Somebody years ago raised a question to me about should a Kohen even go to Europe now? Uh-huh. All right. Because the ashes... Are all over. Are all over. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. And so at, at, but by extension, it was like, I remember that's what occurred to me when the Chernobyl disaster happened, that they, you know, charted the cloud. So once it goes up into space... Then, then it keeps it, traveling, the it, wind. Right, and so it crosses the entire world, of that, you know, in, in a period of time. So the Tuma from the Shoah really enveloped the whole world. All right. So how you do deal with that spiritual? I mean, the, the reality of the physical Tuma and dealing with it on a spiritual plane. Yeah. Is the challenge. Yeah. Right? Yeah. What's what's the what's the equivalent paraduma for that for that? We haven't gotten that one yet. You see, every time they're talking about where they're gonna dump the leftovers, you know, the atomic mm-hmm. uh, ashes, the leftovers from the various uh, furnaces and so on and so forth. That one we haven't found a way of neutralizing it yet. Right. So, but I think a dogma is very is a very strong one to to be able to say that this is a pollution that we have to do something to clear it up. So, an experience that we had. Um, you remember that in Berkeley there used to be a uh, uh, a sweat lodge, and the woman closed it down for a number of years. So, um, Alter Berry uh, convinced her to reopen it just before, well, right at the beginning of Elul. So a number of us went for the ritual, and uh, Barry had explained to her that we needed to do levels of, of, of tshuva, and that part of it had to be forgiveness for, and left it up to her to, to, to tell us what we were doing it. Did I think four. four rounds? The first three were easy, and I don't even remember what they were. All right, and we really did it. Then she said, "We're going to forgive Adolf Hitler." That I mean, even with our Aquarian minion fellow, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. couldn't go there. And I remember thinking that the Tuma was so powerful. That it overcame the, the heat, the the heavy of the, that was coming up from the sweat lodge. Yes. Yep. yep. And so I don't know. I mean, you're right. We don't have the means. Well. I, I would like to share. Something. <clears throat> Please. And the last DLTI, um, I was in the group that uh, was responsible for Havdala. Yeah. And. Um, yeah, Davening Leadership Training Institute. Now they call it Intensive instead of Institute. Because um, <laughs> it's really intense. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and um, it happened to be that it was uh, me and Yalda from Germany mm-hmm. and two other ladies who just recently visited. One visited Auschwitz and the other one visited Dachau and um, had a deep, probably deep uh, past life experiences in those places. Mm -hmm. And Yalda has uh, obviously, being in Germany, a deep uh, family connection to the Holocaust, Mm -hmm. and so am I. Mm -hmm. And so we were that group. Mm -hmm. And we were thinking how to do a meaningful Havdalah. And it came very clear to me and Yalda, and we kind of had to persuade the other two ladies that we actually need to bring the Holocaust to the surface. And it was so out of place of whatever we do in the LTI in El mm-hmm, We mm-hmm. never touch it. It's all, you know, <laughs> airy and fairy and spiritual and full of light and love. And it was a little heavy. 
and not everyone agreed with that. And it was a very hard process to actually agree. And, one of, and, and sometimes a member of our group would back out and say, I can't do it. I mean, we mm -hmm. really grappled with that. And we finally did a very powerful of the law. That we took the idea from Shefa. We created four gates. And, and what we wanted to do is exactly that, a spiritual purification of bringing that heaviness into the light of joy and, and, and creating some kind of havdala on that. And um, we sang Pitchuli um, Sharei Tzedek. Yeah. And, um, and we went through the four rituals of, uh, of the wine and the besamim and the light and the last mavdil. And, um, and each, for each gate, one of us told uh, something from the heart that had to do with their experience of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. and, and we offered it in the dance. So we had people holding hands, two people holding hands like this with a talit. And the rest of the kahal danced through, through the gate. Through underneath the gate, And yeah. that was the offering and going through that and bringing it to the level of joy. And then coming back and then came another story. And we again danced. Four times we danced. Um, it is something that Shefa did before many times, but we twisted it for the whole To make it work for you where you needed yeah. it, sure. And um, it was... Some people were in shock. They didn't really, they couldn't put together the theme of the Holocaust with the joy of the dance and, and the ceremony of the, of the lines. They didn't understand how we dared even to do that. We took mm -hmm. some risk here, in a way. Yeah. And other people felt it as a very, very powerful experience. And some of the people said, from now on, we are going to adapt it, but not for Avdalah. Maybe we will make a, a Yom HaZikaron, Yom HaShoah, yeah. as an experience rather than talking about, but actually moving the community in Yom HaShoah with that kind of a ritual. Right. I, to, to do the, uh, what was it, um, that See, it's always bothered me that I find in Jewish renewal a reluctance to confront, to talk about the Holocaust. It's Keilu, it, ha it should be ignored because there are so many people in Jewish renewal who are children of survivors. One of the, and so to always have this thing go from the, ex the, the negative experience back into the, the, the renewal joy has bothered me when they attempt to confront it. One of the most powerful experiences I ever had, ritually, regarding this, was the second Simchat Torah um, we had, I had at uh, the seminary in the 60s. The first one, the students were so fed up with how dull it was that we decided to invite certain people to attend the student ones. So we invited Heschel and we invited Elie Wiesel. And we asked Eli Wiesel to daven Mariv. So he stood up there and he davened Mariv in Eicha Trop, Erev Simchat Torah. Mm -hmm. And that moved into the, the joy of dancing with the Torah. All right? Mm -hmm. And I was reflecting on that when I read Shaul Magid's article, all right, about the covenant holding the Torah, which represents the Old Covenant. And, and what your suggestion is, is about the covenant has to be dealt with, that there's a need for a new covenant. It's the only way we're going to relate to the Shoah, because we relate to it based upon the Old Covenant. You can't ignore it. It's there. It's like the pink elephant. There is a covenant between God and us, and the Shoah has to have broken it. There's no other way around it. So how do you ritualize that? You can't go so quickly into joy as a result of that. And there's this almost, I sense this desperate need to, to go back to what we're working on, to get rid of the Tuma. You know? We're covered with the Tuma. 
In our lifetime, the tumor is not going to be removed. Just a second, Ruth. Nadia, would you do me a favor? Mm. In the last uh, uh, shelf, way, way over near the office door, there should be a copy of Paradigm Shift, if you'd bring it, please. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I just want to quote a line from there. Go ahead. No. Um. <clears throat> So if we don't try. No, no, I'm not suggesting that we, that we don't try. It's like um, sometimes I think it's the difference between keep, you know, we keep a kosher home, all right? But when it comes to the, the nikayon for Pesach, Nadia becomes obsessive, all right? That, and so there are stages of removal, Thank you. all right? Pesach is the time... There ain't nothing in our house that, that's chometzdik. In the rest of the time, you're not as mcdock about the, the whole thing. The fact is, is I mean, it's like going, when, you go, when somebody goes, a, a Jew goes to one of the camps, Auschwitz, you know, Dachau, you encounter an intense tuma, all right? You step through the gates of Auschwitz, and you become tumaized, all right? And it's not sufficient to wash your hands when you leave. You get the feeling that you need to, what was the word? Scourge. Scourge the soul as well as the body. But you can't scourge the soul. There's no way in our time you can scourge the body, all right? I mean, when you go to a cemetery, for a few, when you do a funeral and you walk out and you wash your hands, it, it's almost ritualistic, but it's not complete. All right? So, I, I mean, I just, I, I mean, I'm, I, I'm continuously, my whole adult life has been conflicted. And actually, it's not my adult life. When I was a child, you know, I lived in Germany for... Um, almost three years, and um, this was in the mid-50s. So the country was still, I mean, the cities were still destroyed. It was still occupied by the French and the British and the Americans. And, and on the other side, the Russians. And on the other side, the Russians. I was there during the Hungarian Revolution, which was an intense, tense period. But there was a, I mean, as a child, that's where I, I my introduction to the Holocaust. I became too young, but I started reading everything I could on it. And living there, I felt polluted. Mm. All right? There was no way to escape that pollution. And to me, the whole... I mean, I'm extending it now, but I remember thinking that all of Germany, and now I extend it to the rest of the world, is a graveyard. When we were... When Tom and I... Uh Two summers ago, went to Auschwitz and then visited the cemetery in um, in uh, Krakow, in Łódź, in Warsaw, and in Prague. Everywhere we went, we went to the Jewish cemetery. The one in Łódź is, they say, claim the largest in Europe. But I know that Yalda says that in Worms it's the largest in Europe, so it doesn't matter. But by the end of the trip, and we were in Europe, you know, you Prague is so beautiful. At the end of the trip, I looked at Tom and I said, you know, all of Europe is just one big Jewish cemetery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, that, and Auschwitz. That's how it felt. It's like, and I have no desire to go back to Europe. And, and I, I mean, I will go to Sicily, to Rome, to Spain, but not, you know, it's just, yeah. there is nothing here Wiesel, for us. I just wanted to like, quote, at the end of Elie Wiesel's um, Mara. Well, no, the one that when he says when he goes back to Germany, yeah. the journey back to Germany, the first time he goes back, he concludes the essay, "I shan't return." And I don't know if he has in his lifetime. Well, what you know, can I? I wonder. I'm, I'm listening to all this, and it, I just can't help but wonder if this, the magnitude of this devastation and the and the death and 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 the that the remnant you know is so widespread that you're speaking about it as a pollution you know a, 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 a sort of a, a film of pollution around the whole earth 
if it's not an invitation for us to completely reframe, reformat how we experience death and the and what and the remains. Be, be, I mean, you're talking about you know the new covenant and that 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 the Holocaust is the you know is is, is what um, broke the old covenant, but you know, and, and we, we talk new paradigm, new paradigm, new paradigm. Um, and I realize as I sit here, you know, that I, I think I have a very, very different experience of, um, of death and the, and I'm wondering if Ruth too, because you, because of the work, your holy work with the Hebra Kadisha, I have such a different experience of what it is to be in the presence of a Met, um, what it is to walk through a cemetery, that I have a hard time relating to, to the heaviness that's being uh, described and felt here, and wondering if part of this whole thing, the, 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 the magnitude of this, is not an invitation to reframe, to reformat that whole concept in the new paradigm. Because, you know, you, you, you can't lift it if you're sitting in the old paradigm. You're not going to lift it or cleanse it or clear it. You have to be in a new relationship with death and the, and the, and the remnant, that, that what remains after death, in order to face these questions that are being, that are being formed here. Well, a couple of things. It's really clear that on the level where the, 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 the conflict exists, you can't solve it there. You have to go higher. My experience in Germany uh, was different. My experience even in Auschwitz and Birkenau was in some way different, yes. First of all, uh, there was a time when I had wanted to have uh, my remains cremated, and uh, for Shalom to take the ashes to Birkenau and, and leave him there because I felt that that would have been a way in which Claudius Royal could have said something to the world, you know, that this is not going to be a place for us to cholile, um, how would I say, despair, but to say we want to join those Kedoshim after 120 and, and make this into a positive thing, okay? Why did you change? Huh? Why did you change your view or design? Um, partly because of um, the issue that I now would like to see uh, a cemetery for um, leadership in, in Aleph to be happening now at uh, Friedman, Isabella Friedman, in the woods. Mm. Hmm. I, you know, when, when Reb David Olav HaShalom where David Olaf Shalom was uh, buried, uh, I asked him to do it all night that the, that they could be ex that he could be exhumed and put into such a cemetery. Mm -hmm. And for a while, I was talking to um, Neiman, um, but it looks like this this uh, real estate isn't going to be it anymore. Mm -hmm. So uh, now I've talked to Adam there about and showed him a place in the forest, because I wanted to be in the forest. Um, right now, we don't need more pollution in the air, and so on and so forth. I'd much rather have it go through the cycle of, of mm. uh, and therefore no embalming and all that kind of stuff. Okay. But then, I want to say something else. Um, there, there was one cell in... Uh, Auschwitz, where a person had done an image of Mary with his fingernails on the wall. Now, this guy was being tortured and so on and so forth, and this is, this is what he did there. Stories about some people who wanted to wash their hands and say, make a broch on Kiddush Hashem, and some people even dancing that they would have the opportunity of doing Kiddush Hashem. Now, I think that was a mistaken thing, because that's the mistake between that they treated Purim as if it were Hanukkah, you know? In other words, expecting that 
someone will come with a crucifix and give him a way out. And this is not the way it happened. They were against the goof and not against the neshama and so on and so forth. So that didn't work. But when I raised the question, what was our contribution to her to Holocaust, I always get this very, very terrible uh, uh, thing from people. You know, how could you say we did, we did, we did? I think we talked about it already before, so that we do we 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 do have a contributory thing there. But if you go and you say, as you described that um, sweat lodge, and you get to see that something that after the curtain falls and all the actors come out, you know, then even Hitler gets an applause for having played such a bad uh, thing. Okay. That's where Purim comes in mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. So that you can see deeper than that. But that's not the way in which it's going to come out for people for a long, long time. Because we can't, we can't see it. I was so pissed at uh, um, um, No. It's so hard to, to have to have an, an elder head at this point. Mm. Um, he wrote he wrote the joyous cosmology. Uh, uh, he wrote beyond theology. He used to be an English clergyman. Then he wrote about. Uh, give me his name. Not what. Ah, yes, Alan yeah, Watts, Watts, right, thank you, <laughs> Alan Watts. So Alan Watts wrote a book in which he had a footnote, and the footnote said something about uh, how the herd has to be sometimes trimmed. And when you look at pruning a tree, and when I start looking at where Judaism was in 1930s, it wasn't so freilich, you know, we... we the, the, the people who want to be restorationists want to say the great yeshivas that there were in, in Poland and so on and so forth. We didn't have as many people in yeshivas as we have now mm. then. For all the brisker and the volosian and, and all that stuff, we didn't have as many people in yeshivas as we have now. If you look at the, at the demi monde, the underworld that was there at, at that time, You'd find a lot of Yiddelachim there. Look at cabaret and, and that that world, and you see the language that in Germany was Gaunersprache, and they used to have a lot of Yiddish in there. So I think you know the, that that stuff people don't want to think about. And the truth of the matter is that there has been because of that terrible thing. There has been such a we began doing infrastructure. There weren't that many people who ate glot kosher as they're eating glot kosher now. In Europe, only certain Sidim Rabbanim wanted glot. Plain kosher was, was, was good for most people. You know, there were very few people who were expected to have Chol of Yisrael. When I grew up in Vienna, I can't recall um, anybody uh, who wanted to, to Dafke find Chol of Yisrael and where they got Chol of Yisrael. Because it was very clear that the Vina Molkarai, you know, that the dairy of Vienna was trusted enough not to have a horse or camel milk <laughs> or pig milk in, in, in their milk. So you see that there's there's been a lot of stuff that's been the growth because of the trimming that's happened. Now, who wants to look at that today and, and say that this was a good thing that it happened? You know, nobody's going to say that. But there's a difference between Lachat Chil and Bede Avad about these kinds of things. And the other thing that's even more troubling is we would say, never again, we will not permit this again. And then we were quiet in Biafra and we are still not doing as much as we could do about Sudan and so on and so forth here. here. And when it was in, in uh, Bosnia, and I, I find that, uh, yeah, we, the lessons that we claim to have learned, we haven't, we haven't learned yet. So there's, a, and I don't think this can happen very fast, you know. When, when I start thinking, how many years must it have taken 
between Yetzirah and Mitzrayim and uh, the first real Seder that people had. And when I look through the Tanakh and Yeshua and Shoftim, I don't find anything until we get to Yoshiyahu and so on and so forth. Pesach is hardly ever uh, dealt with. Uh, and so like a not, it becomes a non-event. There aren't references to it. Pesach you want. You, know, you want a Seder? I want references to it. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Look at Shabbos. Uh, if, 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 you, if you discount what's in Yechesko on Shabbos,